It is Friday, September 13th, 2024. This is another edition of Football Today, presented to you by Captain Morgan, the official spiced rum of the NFL. These are my dudes, Justin Pennick, Bobby Skinner, producer Mikey along for the ride as well. I am Chris Rose. All right, guys, a lot to get to. We're going to preview week two, get you all set for the weekend, update you how we did on our picks in week one, have a lot of fun there. Unfortunately, Thursday night football, not a lot of fun, certainly for the Miami Dolphins and really for the entire sporting globe because based on what happened, the Bills ended up winning the game between AFC East rivals as their dominance of the Dolphins continued. 31-10 was your final. Obviously, the big news is Tua Tungavailoa suffering yet another concussion. Knocked out early in the third quarter when he ran for a first down and ran smack dab into DeMar Hamlin, of all people. Concussed on the field. Had the little fencing gesture as well where the hands kind of go still. The whole bit, it was a scary, scary sight. Mike McDaniel, their uh, their coach afterwards, said, listen, he's going to be evaluated on Friday. We don't have much else for you. Bobby, let's start with you here. Um, there's going to be a lot of talk about Tua and his playing future and everything else. Uh how numbing was oh, this the, to the watch? first thing is like again really again like for you know I, I don't think I remember anybody really having the fencing pe- po- posture except for Tua um and then everyone you know, then you're just you're just hoping like you see him walk off and again there's no like good concussion but at least at least he was able to walk off you know McDaniel said he was in good spirits and you know alert and all that stuff after the game so you're glad to hear about that but I know everyone wants to speculate and say, too, you know, what if he doesn't play again? I, I mean, I, I'd be shocked if he's not back this season. Yeah, I, I'd be shocked, too. And I, I don't really, you know, I, I don't know if people expect us to have a concussion safety conversation in the NFL. I, I don't think this is the place. I don't think that's our necessarily our strength. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's what we're going to have. But. You see the fingers thing, you know, and I, I know Chris, you you know the formal name of it, but um, you you see that, and it's just like you, you know immediately what it is, and and that stinks. And Mike McDaniel and Tua together have done a good job of, especially last year, of keeping Tua healthy, and that was a big part of 2023. Is well, is Tua going to be able to stay upright and play healthy? And you know, he played all those games. He got a big contract. And because of we're getting the ball out of our hands quick, we're limiting our opportunities of not running a lot. Um, and, you know, Tua ha- doesn't have the best of games, tries to put his head down, get a couple extra yards. And turns out that DeMar Hamlin isn't even the one that hits him that hard. It's Tua that just mm-hmm. takes that hit to the neck and takes it to the head. And, you know, here we are again. It's, it's, a, it's a shame, man. It, it stinks because, you know, this is – these are good football players. These are good dudes. These are, you know, people that are good for the sport. And you know, the fact that this kind of stuff happens is is not is not fun. No, it sucks. In fact, and one of the the biggest question going into last year with Tua was, can he give the Dolphins seventeen games? And he did. And what did he do? He ended up leading the league in passing yards. The first Dolphins quarterback to do that since Dan Marino. And I know that obviously. There were questions. Well, is he deserving of a long-term deal? Well, he ended up getting that for two hundred plus million dollars, and he was their guy moving forward. And he still might be. We do not know. Obviously, what you're going to hear is a lot of former football players that are probably going to say, a decent share of them, "Hey, man, this is it. This is where you've got to call it quits." The reality is, is that it's none of our jobs to tell somebody how to live their life, right? You would hope that he would certainly sit down. And have this discussion with his family. He's got his wife. He's got two young kids. Um, he's got parents that love him. He's got a brother that we know played football. The whole bit. And whatever the decision is, we might not agree with it whenever it comes down. I think we just have to respect it. Because whatever decision, the minute you set foot on that field for the first time, you're taking a risk. That is just the occupational hazard of this sport. Um and we're all going to have different opinions about it, but I just want to—I don't know. We'll give him his time. That's what I would yeah. say. Yeah, so there's the really mu- not much to say until yeah. you, they get more information on you know when he could in the right. you know when he's out of concussion protocol and how often you know when he's out, how quickly does he come back? I mean, I'm not going to sit here and speculate on his head injury. No, that's that's irresponsible. So we won't. We will talk about a game, and I know it, it feels kind of crappy to talk about a game after what we just saw, but that's that's the reality of what we do here. So 
this was not close. Uh, Buffalo came in prepared, physical. It's tough on a short week when you're traveling. And the Bills, particularly, I thought defensively, Justin, is is where they made their money. And they did it without a couple of starters. They lost a couple during the game. And they were just way tougher than the Miami Dolphins on Thursday night. Yeah, and they played fast. Uh, I do think the Dolphins are a team that if they really want to, they can commit to a run-first attack, and that's kind of what they tried to do tonight with Devon Achan. And, man, you know, they had some successful plays in there, but for the most part, you saw a very, very fast Bills defense, and everybody from linebackers to safeties to corners, everybody contributing. There was a total of 10 tackles for loss tonight. Mm. 10 tackles for loss 10 negative plays that have nothing to do with even throwing the ball with an additional five quarterback hits as well um, tonight as well. So, I mean, t- 10, 10 tackles for loss, I might I add. And Ed Oliver was the one who led the team with two. So that means there's how many other players that are all getting involved in getting a negative play tonight. So you saw at fast, least nine, at least yes, nine, according to at my least math. nine. So if you're doing the math there, thank you, Chris. I'm not a math guy. So you saw a fast physical Buffalo Bills defense. Um, and even when, they tried to drop back to pass. I feel like I was watching the, the next gen, the next gen vision prime broadcast, which shows you that all 22 angle to begin with. I thought they did a good job of bracketing Tyree kill. He was barely open down the field. Uh, there were times where Waddle was open because they're bracketing uh, Tyree kill. So that's inevitably going to happen, but it didn't happen much. Um, so they limited the big plays. They got negative plays. Uh, they, they, did a good job of keeping the Dolphins kind of behind schedule with, with those negative plays, and they wanted to run the ball, and it worked at certain times, but not enough to sustain drives. I think they were one for four in goal-to-go situations tonight. You're not going to win a lot of games, and you're throwing three to interceptions. And let me just correct myself. Nine total. So if Oliver had two, and that would take us down from ten to eight, so that would be eight others, so nine total. Bang. Thank you. Okay. We're DeMar back. Hamlin, Bailey Bobby. Spector, Dorian Williams, Rasul Douglas, Taylor Rapp, Greg Rousseau, Vaughn Miller, Casey Toole. Those are the other guys. Shout out all of them. Um, The Bills have done, and I'm I'm excited to talk about the Bills' offense, but what the Bills have done defensively, and it's been like this for a while, is they've done a good job at getting two-way players, right, from from every single level, but especially up front, right? We see Greg Rousseau blossoming into a player. Ed Oliver has been really good and just got paid recently. A.J. Epinesa has come on, you know, uh, over the last year and a half. Vaughn Miller, you know, he doesn't look like his 2014 self, but he looks like he's returning to his 2020, 2021 self. Um, you know, I saw the next gen with the pressure stuff. He's, lo- he's looked a lot better uh, uh, this season, off, where yeah. last year it just looked slow and not there. So they've done a good job with that. And then, you know, I think they've done a decent job, you know, making up for the losses of those two safeties, Poyer um, and Hyde, and then losing Milano and, and the – preseason so they just they play a physical brand of football but they also like you know they're not they're not robots back there either they can move and they can play coverage so they're good um i think this bills is this bills team is taking on an identity to be there for the long run right like once again we saw them run the ball more than they throw it you know and that's not just because they had the game won up until the fourth quarter you know at the end of the third quarter they had more runs and passes uh you know, that was the same last week. Um, even when you, you know, split the Josh uh, Allen scrambles, it's basically even. I really think, one, they want to just be a good running team, right, and getting the value of doing that. But the way teams are playing Josh Allen, the way they play Patrick Mahomes, is to stop those explosive plays. You're seeing Allen bring down his average depth of target, um, you know, this year compared to the last two years. So being more patient, no interceptions. So letting Allen be patient – but not asking Allen to be patient on 40 dropbacks per game because that's just that's just hard to do. So let him be patient on 25 dropbacks, 25 to 30, and then run the ball in those other plays. And I really think they're setting it up at the, for the end of the season because if they keep running the ball like this, teams are going to start playing them differently, and that's going to open up the door for some mm-hmm. explosive plays once they get to the playoffs in the end of the season. So. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how committed they can stay to it because they've done it the first two weeks, but will they stay committed and if they find themselves down seven to a team that has a better offense? I think the most important thing is that we all wondered, what is Buffalo going to look like? Who's going to catch the ball? 
Stephon Diggs might have been a pain in the ass at times, but he is also a very good football player. What? Well, here we are. A little more than, uh, you know, a ba- uh, we're a week into the season. They got two wins. They've got a road divisional win. And their schedule coming up is is interesting. Jacksonville, at Baltimore, at Houston, at the Jets, then against the Titans, at the Seahawks, before the Dolphins pay a visit in early November. So, you know, I, I think that this has gone great for Buffalo. The first quarter and a half of the season sucked. That happens to a lot of good teams. Um, but I think they're feeling just fine. I, I think there were a lot of people that were like, okay, well, Miami made a huge stride last year and was one quarter away from taking the AFC East away from Buffalo. Aaron Rodgers is coming back and joining a fantastic defense with the Jets. And Buffalo at times felt like an afterthought before this year in that division. They're yeah, not. I mean, they're my, they've been my pick to win division. But And this is another thing with the Bills offense because it's going to be different this year with that Stephon Diggs. Because like right now they don't have a single player with over 100 receiving yards through two games. Right? That, that's kind of crazy. But when we all talked about like, oh, they want to be a little more run heavy, you know, they balance, spread it out. You know, one reason why they also do it, too, is because James Cook is actually pretty freaking good. You know, we forget that on a team that had Stephon Diggs, he was fourth in the NFL in rushing last year. Paired with the second best, uh, you know, rushing QB in the NFL, he was second in running back scrimmage yards, six in just total for the NFL. Like we forget James Cook is pretty damn good. And he had himself a game this, uh, you know, he's explosive. He had the long touchdown run, had the one the goal line. And then they ran that mesh traffic play and he's, you know, able to catch that ball. Um, you know, the way he eliminated uh, the angle of Jordan Poyer, who, you know, he was fired up on that long run. Like James Cook is in a really explosive threat that they have and is, was awesome for them last year. Yeah, I want to. I'm going to pat myself on the back again because there's a reason why a lot of people want to draft running backs that have the highest explosive run rates in college football, that that's the stat that best translates to the NFL. And even though James Cook didn't have a lot of experience in college, that's exactly what he had at Georgia. And I'm happy to see that that's translated early in his NFL career. Uh, the mesh traffic concept that the Bills ran, it was a good opportunity for Bobby and I to, tra- to uh, reshare videos that we made last year. I made a video on the 49ers and the and the Bills running the mesh traffic concept with McCaffrey and Bill and Cook respectively. They ran it in the same weekend for touchdowns and then the Giants ran it I think a couple days later to Saquon Barkley against Washington. Bobby made a video on it and we both reshared that video tonight. So that was so that was cool to even get a throwback of that and you know kind of just snap your finger and be like, "Hey, I recognize that concept and we've talked about that before." So that was a so that was a cool moment. Uh, James Cook, 7.1 yards per carry. Awesome. Um, you know, to- two touchdowns tonight and then another another receiving one as well. The only thing that I'll push back with the with the Bills offense, Keon Coleman got the Jalen Ramsey treatment tonight where I think Keon Coleman got one target. He should have brought that down. That pissed me off. That's your really job. Matter. He should have brought that and down. What? That's the play that, that Keon Coleman needs. That's what yeah. they brought him in to make. Make that play. Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, that that's the only reason the only reason why I'm going to push back is that we're not going to have you know games where the Bills de- if defense are going to force three interceptions, they're going to get a pick six. The Bills offense only ran 42 plays. You know, 22 rushing plays to 20 pass plays and I think Josh Allen, I think Josh Allen had only 19 attempts. I don't know why my one site saying that they had 20 pass plays. Um I don't think that's going to happen every week and I do think the Bills need to have we need to start to get more answers besides Khalil Shakir and Dalton Kincaid on who we could throw the ball to and who we could be reliable for. So I get running the ball is great, and it, and it is going to work with this Buffalo team because I think they can kick ass. James Cook can be explosive. And the Josh Allen touchdown was just incredible too, the the one that he had to Ray Davis. And speaking of Jalen Ramsey, that third down, that's Josh Allen rolling out to his right, and Ray Davis is running a route. And who is that over? It's over Jalen Ramsey. Yeah. So I mean that's a ballsy hell of a throw by Josh Allen there. Uh, I'm not concerned. I'm not gonna. I'm not sitting here poo pooing on the Bills' offensive performance, but still having this caveat in the back of my mind, we need some more receivers to step up for this Bills' offense if we really want to, you know, continue to compete down the stretch. And I'm guessing that they will. Um, yeah. We'll have much more on Monday's show about what things mean for the Miami Dolphins, how long Skylar Thompson might be under center, and everything else regarding Tua Tungavailoa. Once we find out more about his health. 
uh, which I'm sure the Dolphins will find out in the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, We've got our predictions. We're going to break down the rest of the schedule for week two. And oh, so much more is coming your way here on Football Today. But first, Justin Pennick. All right. Thank you, Chris Rose. And as you all know, on Friday, we got to talk about Captain Morgan. We got to talk about the Captain Morgan Playmakers League because this episode is brought to you by Captain Morgan, the official Spice Rum sponsor of the NFL. This NFL season, you got to have the right players in the game, in the right spots. But sometimes you got to spice some things up. And the same goes for your drinks. And oh boy, the Captain Morgan Playmakers League, it's getting spicy over there. Joe's McFly walks in Monday morning pissed that I beat him by a whopping 50 points. Uh, Joe McFly, uh, according to Sleeper, so, you know, Sleeper gives, like, these these awards, um, ba- basically gave Joe's the worst manager award because his bench had a lot of points and his starters had the lowest amount of points of the week with 90. But Dalton Philly and Talking Jake were the class of the field. Dalton Philly had 170 points. Talking Jake had 165 points. I went 1-0 with 140 points. I'm facing Zo Damalia this week. Um, his team name is a team is a team name to be named later. Um, so I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll keep you. We'll keep uh, taps on if he's actually going to have a team name or not. But I actually kind of like that team name. So there you go. That's your Captain Morgan Playmakers League summary. I'm one and zero. I'm looking to go two and zero against Zo. Visit CaptainMorgan.com to find Captain near you. Please drink responsibly. Captain Morgan Original Spice Rum, 35% alcohol by volume. Captain Morgan Rum Company in New York, New York. Bobby Skinner, Chris Rose, producer Mikey, everybody. You'd be glad you did. Let's talk some football. Yeah, let's do it. As we look ahead to the rest of the week two slate, um, let's start with this. We we make predictions on the all the rest of the non-Thursday night games. We did not do great week one. So, guys, we have got to be better as a year. I went 10 and 5. I feel happy about mine. Yeah, yes, Bobby went did, 10 and 5. You did well. And then, Panic, you and I went eight and seven with all that being said panic went we, seven and eight don't let's get it oh, right. I, I went i went i went seven mikey, and, eight. and shout out eight. shout out by the way to a uh, rich or uh, rich blunk uh you know producer oh. mikey's keeping track of it too but rich on uh on the week one recap show mm-hmm. left a reply with everybody's records and then he also updated his comment after monday night football so thank you to rich for keeping yeah. track of it mikey if yeah. you can hear us out there track our picks and turn it into a graphic every sunday with our records please bang wait Every Sunday, what, what are we not including the Monday games? No, I'm saying well, like, put the graphic out Sunday morning. Oh, yeah, okay. Sunday yeah, morning, got it. Sunday like morning, so the going into the week. Yeah, it was, all right. Let's just get to it. I was embarrassed <laughs> by my performance. Penick, I don't know how you feel, and Bobby's obviously patting himself on the back. I'm very bad at these, so I'm, it's going to continue. <laughs> we're focused on. We're on the week two. We are, and so too are the Cincinnati Bengals. Cincinnati is on to Kansas City. So it's the 0-1 Bengals taking on the 1-0 Chiefs, who it feels like haven't played forever. They played the opener on that Thursday night. Uh, Joe Burrow, 3-1 and all-time against Patrick Mahomes. In fact, Cincinnati is the only other AFC champion other than the Kansas City Chiefs since 2021. Bobby Skinner, the Bengals looked horrific against the New England Patriots. Are you worried going into the home of the two-time defending Super Bowl champs? Well, I am, and I want to. I want to ask another prompt: What is more likely to happen a second time? Joe Burrow losing to the Chiefs, or uh, the Bengals winning a Week One or Two game with hmm. Joe Burrow at quarterback? Because neither one of those, you know, those things have only happened one time. Uh, you are, because it, it seems like T. Higgins isn't going to play. Um, you know, he didn't practice on Wednesday. I haven't heard about Thursday uh, quite yet. Um, and this Chiefs pass rush got after it the last time these two teams matched up, you know, with, uh, you know, despite the fact that Jake Browning was was that quarterback. And, you know, this is this is the same offensive line despite Trent Brown. And I, I wasn't impressed with Burrow. It is early. Like, I feel way, I just feel way more confident in the Chiefs coming out of week one than I do the Bengals. Yes. Yeah, I mean, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Rose. Yeah. Um. Okay, so the Chiefs, I thought, pressured Lamar Jackson pretty well on that Thursday night. I thought they they could have had like a half dozen sacks, except that it was Lamar Jackson. And I am a little bit more worried about Joe Burrow. There is so much noise coming out of Cincinnati between the contract issues. I'm sure there are people wondering how hurt T. Higgins is, right? Um, Cameron Taylor Britt the other day was asked about Xavier Worthy, and he's like, yeah, he can run straight very fast. And that's it. That's all he can do. Like the Bengals taught. There's a lot of noise going around Cincinnati for a team that 
needs to kind of amp it up. Now, their schedule after this game, they're going to be just fine. So even if they fall to 0-2, I'm not totally worried about them. I don't know. Is anybody like Panic? Do you buy into the whole Joe Burrow's wrist? I saw him try and pick up a water bottle and it looked no. like he was struggling. Like, are you worried at all about him? No, I mean, because this is, they just do this every year. You know, this this just happens every single year. Now, I would love for them to go out there and, and, and beat the Kansas City Chiefs. I just don't think it's going to happen because these guys haven't been together. They haven't been practicing. I mean, but Burrow, the, the MO of this offense is let's get rid of the ball quick and get get it to our weapons, and that, that just didn't happen. I mean, they did get rid of the ball quick against the Patriots, but getting the ball to their weapons and then being effective that way. Well, the um, damn ball to Jamar Chase. That's yeah, man. Why, like, that's what they get need the to ball do. to your weapons. This is this is why you're. This is why you want to pay everybody all this money. This is why you invest so much in this passing game. This is why you've ignored certain other facets of, of an offense. It's because you want your identity to be Joe Burrow and you want it to be Jamar Chase. Like let's 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 make that happen. Uh, let's. There was times I, I where he could have like made plays difficult. on Sunday. There was times where he could have made plays on Sunday versus the Patriots, and Joe Burrow just did not throw it to him. Mm -hmm. Throw him the damn ball. That is what makes this offense work. That's one thing. Um, here's another thing for Zach Taylor. Get under center. They they were under center only four times, which means you don't get to run any play action out of no. under center when you don't get to do that, which means you don't run. Another thing, take Mike Gusecki off the field unless it's third down. Whoa! Right. Here's something. <laughs> Mike Gusecki played 18 snaps on Sunday. You know how many of those were running plays, Rose? Zero. 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 You're telling the defense that Failed. you're throwing the ball when he's on the field, and you have Drew Sample, who's a good run blocking. Eric All, who had a, like a, a decent debut and a, li a limited uh, sample size. You know, uh, my friend Mike, who uh, you know Bengals songs on Twitter, wrote a great article. The running success rate with Eric All and Drew Sample on the field for the Bengals was 85 percent. Without them on the uh, with a, in any different personnel is sixteen or fifteen percent. So take Mike Kosecki off the field unless it's third down. Get your like play real football. Stop doing this spread out empty stuff, especially early on in the year. Protect yourself. Allow yourself to run the ball. And when you are throwing the ball out of shotgun and all this stuff, throw the damn ball to Jamar Chase because there was opportunities there and they didn't take them. Jamar Chase has lit up the Kansas City Chiefs in his career. He averages 135 yards per game against them. And Kansas City gave up more than 450 yards week one against the Baltimore Ravens. So, you know, it, it, it'll be interesting. Um, like you, you, you have, the, you have this, this beef on that offensive line. Yeah. You have Trent Brown and Orlando Brown as your tackles, and you don't ever get under center. Like, that's crazy. That, like they're they're beefy. They're not the best pass protectors. They're beefy. Let them let them lean on defenses a little bit and then take advantage of that with some play. Joe, Joe Burrow does not like that. He's come out and said he likes to be in the shotgun formation where he can see the entire field. He likes that. So if your quarterback likes something, that's what they're going to go with. Penick, you got one more thought before we do predictions? Well, my guy Mike Gusecki uh, almost had a touchdown pass, and he dropped it. Which would have changed game, but it was a re it was then they went to the booth, they reviewed it, and then they called it incomplete. So please don't don't disrespect Mike Kosecki like they that. They also had a fumble at the one yard line too. So like I, I agree with you. So I, I mean, Bobby, I agree with you. Where if if the Bengals do want to get bigger, which th again that's that's not Zach Taylor's mo. Their their identity is not getting bigger. Like Chris said, I feel like their identity is not going under center, but they should. In a in a game where against the Chiefs, where they have such a good pass defense, Steve Spags these last two years just seems to have these his guys playing at a at an all time all time level, right? Where even the Lamar Jackson and the Ravens last week were three for ten when they're throwing the ball down the field. So I don't know if these opportunities downfield are going to be there, but Zach Moss and Chase Brown, if you can have some sort of success on early downs running the ball, and if that's there. The Bengals don't like to do that, and they are a team that their pass rate overexpected is super high. They love to throw the ball. They love to spam it. But Chase Brown and Zach Moss, if there's an opportunity for them to eat a little bit, you, you kind of maybe have to let them do it because that's where the Chiefs' defense is susceptible a little bit. That's and, my one ask. And there's uh, the other thing we need to talk about is a big part of this Chiefs-Bengals rivalry, Lou Anarumo versus Patrick Mahomes, right? Been some really good moments for them. I really like the Bengals defense, man. Like it and lost lost in all of the, you know, week one Bengals loss. It's the fact that that coverage unit looks a lot 
better, a lot more improved. Well, but you we know, don't know that. Hold on. They were playing the New England Patriots. I they know. don't have I any know. established receivers in this league and a, a horrific offensive line. So let, let's wait a minute. Agreed. But they made major changes, right? When they had, uh, brought back Von Bell, added Geno Stone, right? That's huge for them. Yes, better. Dax Hill, his first game back at, at outside corner, he looked good. You have Cam Taylor Britt. Um, you know, I I like the way that this coverage unit works, but I'm I'm worried that Anna Rumo's defenses are just going to give up yards on the ground again. Yeah, yeah you know? which is something they do. There's no question. Um, let's do predictions, Bobby, Justin, then I'll go. Rasheed Rice gets a lot of yards. The Chiefs attack the middle of the field, and the Chiefs win. But it's not this high scoring game. My Super Bowl team is going to fall to 0 2. Chiefs Chiefs take care of business. Boy, oh boy, we are all batting a thousand, I think. Well, at least in we're in unison. I don't know if we're going to win the game or all lose the game. We had a few of those losses together last week. All, we all went down together. So we all have the Chiefs in this one. Good. Uh, we got a wild card rematch happening in Motown. Last year, the Bucks uh went up there played a really good game and lost to the lions 31 23 now both teams come in at one and oh lions took care of the rams in their opener bucks throttled washington behind baker mayfield and his four touchdown tosses justin Pennick, baker mayfield riding the hot hand will that continue this week listen i don't know if it's going to turn into a win but i do think this offense is going to have success and i do think this is going to be you know a, a high scoring game I love Liam Cohen, man. Love him. I know it's only week one, and I, and I know Washington's secondary is like anybody's get-right game. Hmm. But look at the, some of the things that he did, even with getting the ball to you know to, to Rashad White's hands in, in the receiving game, uh, getting Bucky Irving in, in space. So I th- I'm, I'm getting on the train of Bucky Irving for RB1 in Tampa Bay. But even... Use it against stacked coverages and using motion there to get to get guys open and before the snap. You saw some things that LA likes to do and LA was doing it and the Rams were doing in 2023 and you saw it there. And when you have weapons like Godwin and, and and Mike Evans who's so long and so big, get these guys going vertically down the field. They're going to be open and Baker Mayfield threw them open too. So Cohen did some fun stuff. They were explosive. Uh, it's a Lions defense that is better. It's a secondary that is better, that has better names. But maybe they're still susceptible to some stuff. But also, you want to know who's good? Mike Evans is good. Chris Godwin's good. Baker Mayfield seems to have a good understanding of what's happening around him, too. Uh, that offensive line looks improved. You have Trisha Wirfs at left tackle holding things down. So I think this is going to be a high-scoring game. Um, I'm, I, haven't, I haven't made up my mind yet on who's going to win, but... Bucks offense is going to have some success, and I'm excited for it. You got about six minutes to decide. Then I know um, I want to hear everybody thing, out because the Bucks played the Lions tough in that playoff game. Mm-hmm. You know, even though they lost twenty to six in the regular season, this is going to be my theme of every Lions rematch from last year. You know, it was a theme. Two like the Bucks had 349 passing yards in that game. That's pretty good. Isn't that pretty good, guys? Mm-hmm. 239 of those passing yards were against guys that aren't getting snaps for the Lions now. Like, the Lions upgraded their secondary. Terry on Arnold had a good week one outside of the penalties. You know, you took Carlton Davis away from the Bucs, who played really well in that game. So, this this is the ju- this is my Bucs judge, uh, judgment game. Uh, not even if they win or lose, but just how well they play them. Because... They're not going to, the Lions aren't going to have busted coverages the same way that the commanders did very often. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's something, right? That's where I'm not in on the Bucks quite yet. And then from the Lions point of view, I mean, Kalaja Kansi might be out. Antoine Winfield, we'll see with him. Mm. Um, but what I want to see, the Lions on the, on offense, they, how did they win last week? They leaned on the Rams at the end of the game. You're not really going to do that versus the Bucks, Right. You know the the Bucks run defense is really is really good. You know only gave 50 yards to the Commanders running backs. Um, you know their worst rushing game in 2023 was versus the Bucks in Week Six. Um, but I think the Lions are going to win this game pretty easily because what the Blitz do as a pass defense is they blitz the shit out of you and Goff balls against them against the Blitz. You know yeah, you 150 yards, 14 of 21, a touchdown in the divisional round versus the Blitz. Week uh, six. 
10 and 19, 170 yards, two touchdowns versus the Blitz. So their Blitzes just don't hit against the Lions because of the pass protection they have. Jared Goff, for whatever reason, loves facing the pewter or whatever color they are these days. I don't even know. Pewter. Yeah, I lose track. 383 yards per game against them. I mean, that doesn't sound possible. That's video game-ish. So I expect uh, Amon Ra to get back on track, not have a three-catch, 13-yard performance like he did last Sunday against the Rams. Um, you know, I like the Lions here. I, I understand not wanting to run against the Bucks, but that is Detroit's identity. We talked about it on our last show where it took them 60 minutes to figure out who the hell they were against L.A., and then once they did, they went right down the field and scored in overtime. So I'll be curious to see if they go that direction. Um, I do have a trivia question for you guys. You like trivia? Yes. Okay, good. I dabble. Okay. Jared Goff and Baker Mayfield are two of only five quarterbacks drafted number one overall to win playoff games for multiple franchises. Who are the other three? Peyton Manning. That's one. Um, Cam didn't do it. No. Eli Carson Palmer? No, they didn't win one for the Bengals. That no. is correct. They did not win one for the Bengals. Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. Uh, Mike Vick? No. He didn't win one with the Eagles? Um, the other two... Uh, one Alex recent, Smith? Alex Smith is the one that I was about to say played recently. And then one has not played in a long time. But you definitely... Bobby, you're going to be kicking yourself. That means he's a Florida guy or like a Miami guy. Is it Vinny Testaverde? It is Vinny Testaverde. Let's fucking go. All right. Good, Good job, job, boys. I think every week I'm going to give us a little trivia question. If you I love that. Mind. All right. So that's my one for today. I lo- That was fun. That was good. Good work on your part. Good, good work on your part. Um, Yeah, I think this is going to be a really fun game to watch. It's the early window, which is interesting. It feels like uh, it could get lost somewhere in the shuffle and. Not very many people will end up seeing it because there's like 10 early games or something on Sunday. Insane. Well, you'll have to watch game day highlights on NFL Network. at 7 Eastern, 430 Pacific with Chris Rose. Plug. Okay. Thanks. Do you guys ever watch, by the way? You don't watch. I I actually watched it Monday morning. I got into the office really early at like 730. And before Good Morning Football, you were on. uh, The one with Steve Smith, game day final. Yes, and so yeah. Steve Smith was uh, – Steve Smith really made a really funny joke. I forget who he was talking to. He was talking about Russell Wilson. Yes. Uh, Russell Wilson is like a, it's like the dad that goes out to buy some cigarettes, and he just has it come back. Never comes back. And that the was face, that, face that you made was crazy. <laughs> it was – it was uh, that was uh, that was Steve Smith to a T. Yeah. Uh, let's do some predictions. Uh, Justin, you start, and I'll go next, and Bobby will finish it. Yeah, up. I'm going with the Lions. They're, they're a kick-ass team. You know, uh, Yaya Diaby had a really good game, and Joe Tryon had a nice sack. But, I mean, the, 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 Lions, the Lions just had – against the Commanders, but the Lions just have – a kick-ass team, man, and I, I do think this is high scoring. I, I want to see some good things out of the Bucks' offense, but lines are just too good. Give me the lines. I mean, I don't know how hard I should push this narrative. From when we picked all the games earlier this season, and I had the Lions finishing at nine and eight. I don't know how you they, had that happen. I don't know either, and so that means at some point I have to have them losing some games. I tried last week with the Rams, and almost almost happened, but it didn't. So I guess I'm going to – I'll go with the Bucks. What the hell? I, All right. I'll be an idiot. Lions win easily. <laughs> you go ahead. You can call me an idiot if you want. There's nothing wrong with hey, it. The, hey, if the Bucks play this tight, I'll, I will be much higher on the Bucks, even if they don't win this game. Right. I, I think the Lions win this game easily. Let's get to the Sunday night game. A pair of 1-0 teams. The Bears, who had to come back from 17 down at home against the Tennessee Titans, they ended up winning the game without scoring – an offensive touchdown. The Houston Texans, nice divisional road win, tight game, a lot of fun against the Indianapolis Colts. So they're both 1-0 here. Uh, Is this the game, though, Bobby, in your opinion, where Caleb Williams, okay, he didn't play well last week. Now this is his first one on an enormous stage, and then people are going to be judgmental one way or another. If he plays great, they're going to be like, awesome, I told you. And if he plays kind of like he did against the t- the Titans, we're all going to be like, well, maybe he's not that good. 
Oh, the pressure is the pressure is is on for Caleb Williams. This is the game I'm most I'm I'm way more excited for this game than Chiefs Bengals. Hmm. Um, just because I think there's just so many great matchups in this game, right? You know, before you, you know, outside of Caleb Williams, you know, uh, you have you know, good three good wide receivers versus three good corners. We'll see if Odunze plays, right? You know, Nico Collins versus Jalen Johnson. Uh, you know, good linebackers versus a team that ran it 30 times, you know, on their fronts, right? They're not the greatest, but they have a really good player with Tunzel and Sweat on the upside side. Um, and I'm just, I'm really, I'm really excited for this. But yeah, Caleb Williams, the pressure is going to be on because they are, the Bears are a talented team. That defense is really good. I think the Bears defense can really challenge the Houston Texans. Um, Caleb's got to play better, man. He can he can't do what he did last week. Now I also think the Bears need to do a little more to help him out. I think it'll be nice to not be going against uh, Jeff Simmons and Tavon J. Sweat, who just destroyed the interior of that Bears offensive line. But you do have to protect against Hunter and Will Anderson. Um, DJ Moore has to win the matchup versus Derek Stingley, which I think he uh, he very well may may do. But you know, how about let's run some play action. Right, they only ran play action five times week one. The Chicago Bears. And they did a lot of that in the preseason, which is weird. And and here's another thing: first, the Texans, sixty-seven percent of Anthony Richardson's yards came off of play action. So give your rookie QB some easy layups, um, you know, some simple, some simplified looks. Where the hell did Justin go? Um, that's that's what I want to see. I want I want to see Shane Waldron make it a little easier on Caleb. But here's the thing with Caleb. he's just got to hit the throws that are there. You know, he missed throws uh, that would have been big plays last week. So you got to hit the throws that are there. But I do think Caleb has a better game this week. It's hard to waste. Sixty-seven percent of the Colts' yards came on three Anthony Richardson throws as well. Yeah. That that ended up looking like punts at times in the air. They were so beautiful. Um, yeah, I, I am a huge Caleb Williams fan. I think that he is going to change football how it's played in Chicago. With all that being said, it was a little alarming how he looked week one against the Titans. But I think that, and I think he's going to get his ass handed to him this week. I think this is just too much. I think the Texans are one of the top five teams in football. I think they built on an amazing rookie year from their head coach and their quarterback and got better in the offseason. They added another weapon in Stephon Diggs. They added a defensive playmaker. Uh, you know, and Daniil Hunter that I think is going to pair with Will Anderson and make, you know, life a real headache. Now, my question is, can the Bears defense, which was so good after the Montez Sweat uh, addition, continue? Because last week they gave up barely 100 passing yards to the Titans. This is you're stepping up from JV to varsity. This, this is a great matchup. So I'll be very curious to see how how this works out. Jeff, there's there's thoughts? two unknowns. For these offenses and defenses that can tell the story, it's the rest of the Texans' offensive line outside of Larry Tunzel. You know, Kenyon Green was a first-round pick two years ago who missed all of last year. He had a good get- debut. Juice Scruggs, their center, in, in year two versus the Bears. What we were like, are they going to get any pass rush outside of Sweat? They did in Week One, right? There, uh, you know, Daryl Taylor two sacks. Uh, uh, Walker did good, and then Dexter and Billings in the middle, right? So I think I feel like that's a big test. Um, I think the Bears' defense is gonna is gonna do really well versus the Texans' offense. And the question is, can Caleb Williams and that offense step up to the plate and put up 24 points on the board? Because I think the Bear, I think this, if that happens, I think the Bears may win this damn thing. I'm hmm. going to eventually need an apology from you about Gervon Dexter. Um, I was right, hmm. pre-draft evaluation. Ah, um, we'll not saying we'll see. Um, remember, I always liked him more than you. That's that's a funny argument we always have. Um, I uh. I'm excited to see this Bears defense. I'm like apprehensive against like, oh, like I just don't want Caleb to look bad. It's not that I'm excited to see Caleb Williams because I want Caleb Williams to be really, really good. So now I'm like a little afraid to see him against the Texans. Um, but I'm excited to see this Bears defense who I think can you know, really can keep the Bears in this game regardless of what Caleb Williams looks like. Here's here's my ask for the for the Houston Texans. Be afraid of what Caleb Williams can do really well, which is beat you with explosive plays. Play with cushion. Have your corners play off with cushion because then that could leave 
I want easy things to happen for Caleb Williams. Take the snap, throw the ball. Like, give him pre-snap stuff like, hey, we see that the Texans are playing this way. Um, like Shane Waldron in that in that offense. Like, we see that the Texans are doing this pre-snap. This can be available to you post-snap, and it's there, and it's easy for you to attack. Get DJ Moore involved in a quick little button hook, and it'll give you six, seven yards on first down, and it's easy and quick. And let's remember that last week, by the way, if you're flipping it over to back to the Bears' defense, they're dealing with a Houston team that ran all over Indianapolis for more than 200 yards. Joe Mixon had a phenomenal debut for the Texans. Um, I guess I'll bat lead off here with uh, prediction time. I actually, I'm worried that we're going to have a Sunday night blowout and Tariko and Collinsworth are going to have to empty the bag. And Melissa Stark, my good friend, is going to have to give us a bunch of, you know, little reports on the sideline to keep us interested on in some things. I hope I'm wrong. Um, I don't care if I'm right or wrong about the prediction. I just hope I'm wrong that it's going to be a Texans blowout. Bobby? Bears win. Defense. <laughs> okay. Bears defense coming out party. This, this where They get noticed. Caleb Williams, do, do enough to get 24 points on the board. This is going to have to be the Bears defense just carrying it, but I, I'm going with the Texans. Mm -hmm. um, if Bobby is right, Caleb Williams will join a very select group of six quarterbacks that will have won in weeks one and two of their rookie season since 1970. The other, going backward, Carson Wentz, Mark Sanchez, Ryan Leaf, Dieter Brock with an asterisk, and Hall of Famer John Elway. Dieter Brock, by the way, has an asterisk because he actually had a re remarkable career in the CFL Joined the L.A. Rams in 1985 as a 34-year-old rookie. So, who could saying. forget him? Well, he did play in the NFC Championship that year against the Chicago Bears. Amazing NFL Films video. That's where the snow starts falling, and Wilbur Marshall scoops up the fumble from Eric Dickerson, runs through the snow, and the Bears are off to their first ever Super Bowl. Go back and check it out, kiddies. Uh, Saints one and zero at the Dallas Cowboys, who are also one and zero. Saints are trying to start 2-0 in consecutive seasons for the first time in 14 seasons. The Cowboys haven't started 2-0 in consecutive seasons since 07 and 08. Justin Pennick, I know that maybe we weren't surprised by the start of the Dallas Cowboys, maybe the way they manhandled them, but we knew that they were a good team going in. But are we really buying the Saints as kind of – I know Bobby is, but what about you? I'm not. I'm not yet. I'm not yet. I mean, I'm glad that I, I will say good for Alva Kamara for coming out and having a really, really strong mm -hmm. start uh, because that was great. I, I kind of thought that that he was that he was washed a little bit. Um, you know, I'm glad Rash Rashid Shahid had a big touchdown. I'm a big fan of his, but I think the Cowboys are too good. I think the Saints are going to wind up. Fall my, I'm going to stick with my preseason take of I do think the Saints are going to be one of those teams that. Uh, that they fall, that they fall below expectations this year. And I think it starts against the Dallas Cowboys. I just think they're too good. They're really good at home. In fact, Dak has won 14 straight home games, 14 in a row. And the Cowboys are putting up 35 points per game. Now, I don't know if they'll do that against New Orleans defense. A little worried about Marshawn Lattimore and his health. Um, you know, and if he's gone, what do they do about CD lamb? But, uh, Listen, da you could say whatever you want about the Dallas Cowboys. They were, you could make an argument they had the best performance of any team in week one. They were outstanding. They were really, really good uh, against a team that's got an awful lot of talent, but obviously has some issues in Cleveland. We'll talk about them in a bit. But I love the way Mike Zimmer called the game in Cleveland. I do not think that the Saints for the third straight game dating back to last year are going to score 47 plus points. And I just don't think they'll be able to keep up with Dallas when they're running like it's a track meet at home, Bobby. Yeah, so I think the Saints defense should look pretty good in this game, right? And because, I mean, I, you know, you guys know how much I like them. They have a top five secondary in football. And you're like, well, look how much the how good the Browns defense is. And the Cowboys put up 33 points on them. But the Cowboys had two legit legitimate touchdown drives. Right. They had 19 points off of 42 offensive yards and the rest of them. 19 points off of 42 offensive yards. The issue, though, is that Derek Carr is awful under pressure, and the Cowboys are going to get after him. Like yep. I'm, 
I understand if there's one thing I'm not buying about the Saints off, uh, you know, week one win is that their offensive line is just fixed. Um, some good signs there, but the Cowboys are nuts. You know, they had seven sacks, 12 QB hits, and 21 pressures. They literally had 10 times the success the Panthers pass rush had. Um, and that's that's and that's where um where Derek Carr's his worst is under pressure. And the, the Cowboys, they bring the freaking pressure down in, down out. So I think no matter how good the Saints defense looks in this game, they're, you know, the Cowboys defense is gonna do better. Yeah, that's the thing. Alvin Kamara uh is coming off his 50th game of at least a hundred scrimmage yards. Uh, Christian McCaffrey is the only active player who has more such games. You you know, we forget a little bit about Alvin Kamara because he burst onto the scene and he was awesome down there paired with Mark Ingram. You were like, gosh, they're fun. He can do everything. He catches the ball well out of the backfield. And then it just feels like he's kind of disappeared in recent years. Remember when, when he was like a easy top eight fantasy pick? Yeah. They, he- well, they just had some bad offensive lines as well, too. Um and he's older. Hey, like he's he's an older dude now. And he looked fine he's last like year. Just that offensive line was absolutely brutal. Uh, that, and that's something that, like, with the Saints, hopefully being better on offense. Clint Kubiak is now their OC. Yeah. You know, he comes from he comes from a long line of running the damn ball and doing it well. Um, and so that was that was good to see out of um out of out of Kamara in week one. Uh but let me ask you this though, Bobby. And Justin, if Dallas improves to two and zero, how crazy is the hype train going to be? No, not at all. I actually don't think it is. Really? Like there was a there was a like this survey or whatever. It was a great graph where it's like team Super Bowl odds versus fans hope in the team, and it's like the Bears have hope but not great Super Bowl odds, and then you have the top corner where it's like Super Bowl odds are high or good and hope, and then the bottom left is like. The Cowboys by themselves because their Super Bowl odds are kind of good, but the fans have no hope. So mm-hmm. I mean, in reality, the for the Dallas Cowboys, we're winning the playoffs, especially a win versus the Saints. Even though I'm high on them, that's not moving the needle for anybody. Okay. I think people have learned. People have learned. Wow. People. Are Bobby being Skinner taught. Bobby Skinner taught him last year. Uh, week 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 one or preseason of, of football today. I, I remember hearing it. Remember hearing it. He's like, I'm not. You said I'm not falling for it. And you didn't. Okay, prediction time, Bobby. We'll start with you. We'll wheel wheel around and fin- finish with me. Cowboys win, but their offense looks bad. I think the Cowboys win, uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I know we're we're giving compliments to the Cowboys and what they can do. Their team is worse than last year. Like their offensive line did take steps back. Their running backs are not good. They don't have a ton of reliable weapons outside of Brand, uh, outside of CeeDee Lamb. Maybe Brandon Cooks can get back to more form this year. So this game could be – I wouldn't be surprised if this game is close, but Cowboys, they're just too talented. How about them? We all have the Dallas Cowboys in this one. Uh, Monday night, week two will end in the city of brotherly love. The Eagles, once again, it feels like it's been forever since we've seen them play a game. It has been since they played a game in this country because they took care of the Green Bay Packers in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, The Atlanta Falcons, one of the more disappointing offensive efforts in week one. Uh, They fell to the Pittsburgh Steelers at home. Kirk Cousins and that offense could not get on track. My question to you, Justin, how will it do this week against a Philadelphia team that certainly gave up some points and yards against Green Bay? I would hope it would do better, but you're playing a much better offense against the Eagles, and that's where I think, like, if I'm predicting one game to be a blowout, I, I think it's this. I think the uh, Eagles yeah. are just gonna. I think the Eagles are just gonna take care of business against the Atlanta Falcons. Where, and the Falcon, th- this was this was really concerning. I I don't know if it's gonna be a staple of the Falcons' long run, of them lining lining up at the pistol most of their snaps and not lining up under center, but that that was concerning to me. Kirk Cousins has done that. He's very not healthy. Few, that's why. Very few times in his NFL career has Kirk Cousins lined up in the pistol, and now we're doing that for the vast majority of snaps. Ninety-six and handing, percent. And we're handing off the ball, and I'm pretty sure the only under center snap that he had was a quick like jet 
jet sweep reverse that all, all Kirk had to do was take one step out of the one step out of the backfield, one step away from the center, and then hand the ball off. So his under center snap wasn't even anything like drop regular drop back passing or anything. So uh, Chris Lindstrom didn't have a great game, and I think you'll have the interior of a guy like Jalen Carter um, that that can really eat eat his lunch sometimes, uh, even though he's really really good. Um, I am worried about Kirk's health. I, I'm actually putting together a short right now, a compilation of some of Kirk's throws from last week. And I just, I don't see, I'm not a quarterback expert. And I'm actually going to be calling for like, okay, if you're a QB guy, look at Kirk and how he's pushing off that back leg and you generate power through your legs and through your hips, right? I'm smart enough to know that. Doesn't look like that's happening. And then I went to the first game of last year where it was the Vikings against the Bucks. The velocity and the ball, just it's just jumping out of his hands different. He went from the fourth most play action in the NFL to 0%, zero snaps. Has that ever happened in a game where a quarterback didn't run a single snap of play action? He can't move. They, he drops back and he stands, and he do, and he just doesn't move. He threw zero, zero passes for over 20 yards. He's not healthy. Yet the Falcons, and, and again, you know, I kind of bought in on the Falcons. I'm out. They're just they're just a bad You're out after one game? Yeah, they're a bad franchise. They're a bad franchise. They maybe can win a division, but at the end of the day, they are not a successful franchise because they've put themselves in this pot. They can't play Michael Penix, even though the fact that Kirk Cousins is not healthy enough to play right now, because if Michael Penix plays good for a couple of games, then you you can't take him out. And then you're paying Kirk Cousins $80 million over the next two years. To, to be your backup. He's not healthy, and they can't put the backup quarterback in because of the optics. They, they've they totally fumbled this, um, and I, I can't pick the Falcons to win a game until Kirk Cousins can show me he's healthy enough to move. So are you saying that Michael Penix had the best week one of any of the first-round rookie quarterbacks? Yeah, no. Well, Jaden Daniels won the Pepsi Rookie of the Week, on well, uh, surprisingly. Yeah. Uh, uh, listen. I love the Pepsi Rookie of the Week. My graphics for Pepsi Rookie of the Week are the best. I am um I'm not going to say I'm totally out on the Falcons in part because Pittsburgh th- that's kind of what they do to you. It's a good they defense. Make, they they can are, but Kirk Cousins can't move until he can I, move them out. I know he can't. I This is the third straight week 2 where Kirk Cousins has visited Philadelphia in the Monday night game. I don't know who's got the who, who's playing the haha jokey board in the scheduling in the league office, but it was a catastrophe last year. Oh, the, the fumbles but, at the goal line. It was, yes, it was terrible. He did, he did actually play pretty well. No, I, I'm talking about everybody else. Like Mattinson fumbled the ball. Yes. Jefferson fumbled the ball. Yes. It, like the, it was fumble Ruski in Minnesota early last year. Yeah. Brian he's Flores through. was running three safeties, you know, 25 yards off the ball. And he goes like, well, we will just run it every single play. It was one of the weirdest right. games I ever seen. Three, uh, Cousins did throw for three sixty four and four scores last year in losing. Um, let's flip it very quickly to Philadelphia, which I thought did the best out of any team in utilizing all of their playmakers. Devontae yeah. Smith had a team high seven catches. AJ Brown had 119 through the air. We know what Swan did with more than 100 rushing yards and three touchdowns as well. Dallas Goddard maybe didn't eat a ton, but I think he got four catches close to 50 yards, whatever that was. So they fed their playmakers. When we were talking about earlier, Jamar Chase. Like, you got to feed him. Six for 62 isn't good enough. Ten yards per catch for him is not going to win you a ton of ball games. Um, Drake London, two for 15 uh, for the Atlanta Falcons. Like, the Philadelphia Eagles, week one, they were like, oh, there's a playmaker, there's a playmaker, there's a playmaker, there's a playmaker. We're going to make sure that they are all involved. I thought they did a good job, and I thought the Houston Texans did a really good job. Yeah, my, my line for the Eagles this year is too talented to fail. For As far as it goes for this game, because I think, think the Falcons are a, a pretty decent – like, I'm really excited for the Falcons' defense now that they added Judon and Jesse Bates. Um, if you're the Eagles, just avoid the middle of the field, right? Because that's where Jesse Bates and Justin Simmons are going to make plays. And I'm taking A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith versus A.J. Terrell and Mike Hughes every day of the week. Like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just winning on the outside. The real question will be is – Strength versus strength, Eagles rushing game versus Falcons run defense. You know, they were, you know, Falcons run defense was fourth best in yards per carry in week one. They're number one in EPA last year. And the Eagles like to lean on uh, on guys and get, and give the ball to Saquon Barkley. Um, so I think that'll tell tell the story of the offensive. Like how, how the Eagles are going to win this game. 
but how good does the Eagles offense look will be will will be decided on how good their rushing attack is. And on the on the flip side of that too, the Falcons should just hand the ball off every play. The Eagles rushing game was awful or run defense was awful in week one. And they have Bijan Robinson. Just hand it off every single play. I, I would like to see Bijan Robinson line up under center and not Kirk Cousins. Honestly, um, not the worst idea. All right. So Bobby's got the Eagles. Who do you have, Justin? Yeah, I have the Eagles winning big. Same here. Same here. Uh, that does it for our big games, but we will continue to break down the rest of week two here on Football Today. But first, a word from my buddy, Justin Pennick. Oh, and it's a word from our friends over at the DraftKings Sportsbook. TD Tutty taking it to the house, whatever you call a touchdown. They matter more at the DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner, sportsbook partner of the NFL right now. All new customers who bet just $5 will instantly get $250 in bonus bets plus one month of NFL Plus Premium. Now, that's something that we can all celebrate. You know how much I love NFL Plus Premium. It's helped me get a lot of work done this week, be really productive. So it's just $5 if you bet on anything. Bet on somebody scoring a touchdown. You get $250 in bonus bets plus you get NFL Pro Plus Premium for free. Stay on the action. Use your $250 in bonus bets to bet anytime touchdown on DraftKings, which is the place to bet on touchdowns. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. New customers use promo code FOOTBALL today, all one word, and bet just $5 on any wager. Get $250 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code FOOTBALL today, only at the DraftKings Sportsbook. You'd be glad you did. All right, we continue on as we'll break these down a little bit quicker. Uh, we're going to start with the game out in Denver. Broncos in their home opener. They lost last week at Seattle, and now they will take on the Steelers, who are 1-0, and the only AFC North team, by the way, to win in week one. Uh, sounds like, once again, it's going to be Justin Fields instead of Russell Wilson. Fields, 17 of 23, that is 74%, threw for 156, ran for 57 Played very, very well. Good, competent, clean football for the most part down in Atlanta, even though the Steelers did not score an offensive touchdown. First of all, I have to admit, I wanted Russ to play so badly in this game. And I wanted him so, to win, too. Did you want him to win? Yeah, I want him to beat Sean Payton's ass. Yeah. I just, obviously, you see the team I root for over my shoulder. I, I'm not begging for that, but I wanted to see him play. I did want to see him play. And you know what, Russ, I'm sure they'll probably interview him this week and he'll say, hey, listen, I loved all the people in Denver. You know, I loved it out there. I'm sorry that it didn't work out. That's my fault. Like he's going to say everything from corporate America quarterbacking 101 verbal handbook, if there is such a thing. So I would have expected that. Um, all right, Justin Fields. If he gives another performance like he did last week, Bobby, is he ever giving the job back? No, no, win this game because the Steelers defense is going to beat the shit out of the Broncos. Um, I, I mean, I'm not impressed with Justin Fields last week. Like, I understand they had six, you know, you know, scoring drives, but it, basically all their points came off of deep passes to George Pickett. For the Steelers, for me to be like somewhat a little happy with the Steelers offense, they got to have like a real deal rushing attack. Not like a decent rushing attack. Like they need to have like a, a top five unit with Najee Harris. I'm not even gonna say Jalen Warren because he doesn't he he didn't get any touches last week, and we know how Arthur Smith can be. But they need to have a real deal rushing attack to make that play action a little more effective. You know, they ran they ran it 52 percent of the time, which is most in the NFL. And I'm not I'm not gonna well we're year four. I'm not expecting Fields to grow and be this guy who attacks the middle of the field or anything. Um, Pat Pickens Pickens needs to get a few wins versus Patrick Sertain, get them in scoring range, use Justin Fields' legs. You know, that's that's what will lead to a Steelers win because I don't think they need to do a ton on offense this game. You look pained, Panic. I know. I want to. I want to go with the Broncos because I I want to believe in Sean Payton. I even want to believe in Bo Nix. He dropped back forty two times last week and had less than two hundred yards. That's, that's he was two hard. for 11 with 42 yards and two interceptions on throws of 10 plus yards. Yeah, people clipped up the 10 plus yard throws and it was just not good. And let's, let's look at the Steelers matchup last week. Kirk Cousins was four of eight with two interceptions 
with no throws of 20 plus yards on the 10 plus yard throws. Which, no. Like the Steelers, this Steelers defense is going to be so confident and aggressive and attacking. And there's really no one to fear on this Broncos offense. TJ Watts can, can maybe just win this game on his own. The Steelers are coming after this Broncos offense. Yeah. And What's by your- the way, let, let's say this about Bo Nix and the rest of the rookie quarterback class. Some guys have made it look easy. Joe Burrow threw for less than 170 yards last week, and he's supposed to be one of the best in the league, right? Justin Herbert threw for 150. I know that was more of a game plan and all sorts of stuff. So let's just take our time. Let's give these guys an entire season before we throw them out. There were people that wanted to move on from Jordan Love last year after five games. So let's just let him breathe and see what it is. It just does suck for him that you've got to play Pittsburgh, Seattle on the road, and then Pittsburgh at home. Oh right my my game. my bullet point is like welcome to the league, Bo Nix. Like you yeah. are you are gonna face it. Penick, what else you got? No, that's that <laughs> that's it. I mean, if if anything, I, I I don't know if this is this is being taught, but I think the Steelers do have a, pr- a pretty. The Falcons were a tough you know, on paper. They were a tough opponent week one, and I think they have somewhat of a fun for them run for the early part of the season before their schedule really tightens up the second half. So really, if I'm Mike Tomlin and if I'm this coaching staff, like, hey, we've we've had a defense the last couple of years that has kept us in games, won games, and also they've scored touchdowns. Like that Steelers defense, they've scored touchdowns in the past because they forced mistakes. Let's have an offense that even if we're not doing a lot of fun and sexy shit, we do not make mistakes because we can't afford to make mistakes. Because if we make mistakes and, and, we're, give, and we're giving the ball away – then we're giving the game away. Instead, time it's boring and I hate it. Time of possession, let's try and dominate running the ball. Let's score points when we can, not give it away because we know we have a defense that is going to take the ball away and take the game in their hands. I think that's the message to Justin Fields. Um, Prediction time, I'll go first. I've got the Pittsburgh Steelers in part because Mike Tomlin, 24 and six, against rookie quarterbacks, the only coaches to have a better winning percentage against first years, Don Bill. Shula, Hank Stram. Now, better yeah. winning percentage, yeah. Those are two Hall of Fame coaches, by the way. So I think the Steelers take this one. I think it's an easy one. Bobby? Steelers hold another team to 10 or less and win, mm. but they are the number two scoring defense after week two. My number one scoring defense to come. Wow. Pettick? Steelers, I, I wanted to be different, pick the Broncos. I, I, I can't. How many picks have we differed on? Uh, I think Texans, I'm the only one. Texans, Bears. Oh, yeah, and uh, I had the Bucks in Detroit. All right. Yeah, we better be right or we're going to look really dumb. All right, Niners at the Vikings. Both teams 1-0. and Minnesota, sorry, boys, took it to your Giants last week. 28-6 winner. Sam Darnold looked great in that game. The Niners, in the meantime, really thumped the Jets on the Monday nighter, even without Christian McCaffrey. Um, Panic, how big a worry is that moving forward? Or do you think that they're just kind of slow playing him because of the calf injury? When we really need him, we'll break glass and we'll bust him out. You need to slow play it. You cannot rush Christian McCaffrey back. I, I, I'm all for the whole... Oh, running backs, and you can, or they're replaceable, and you can. I, I'm all for that, but McCaffrey in this 49ers offense, it is just different. It's different, man. Watch McCaffrey play. Even look at the stats. Whatever, whatever. McCaffrey is different, and and I and I recognize that Mason just ran like a angry man, ran like an angry man, and running people over and doing some fun stuff, and it, and it looked great. Looked great. Looked like hey, it looked like you had a guy like Christian McCaffrey on the field for you. But you need McCaffrey back. You're going to need McCaffrey back down the stretch. So I'm not con- I'm not concerned about it because usually what happens with these calf injuries, there's even like whispers of like Achilles stuff happening too. What happens when stuff gets worse and it gets prolonged is when you hurry guys back. The 49ers don't need to rush Christian McCaffrey back because they have Kyle Shanahan. They have that offensive line who, F me, who was uh, Dominic Pooney looked great moving people and moving out in space, even though I liked him at the senior ball. Trust your evaluation, Justin. Um, they ah. looked fine. Don't rush him back because he's way more important down the stretch than needing him right now, week two, week three, week four, week five. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you their schedule coming up. After Minnesota, they're at the Rams, 
home against the Patriots and Cardinals at Seattle before taking on the Kansas City Chiefs and Dallas Cowboys in back-to-back weeks, and then they get their bye at week nine. I'm, I firmly believe this. You will not see him until at earliest the Seattle game and possibly that Kansas City game. I, I think that, that Kyle Shanahan thinks that we have enough talent elsewhere and we can scheme guys and our defense is going to kick enough ass to where we need we need him from the middle down. And I yeah. I would imagine those are the conversations they're having. They're like, dude, because I can tell you this, the day I was up there, this is the beginning of August, guys. He came on our set when we were doing training camp. He limped onto the set. He limped onto the set. Yeah. And that it was that day where Kyle Shanahan announced that he was he had mispracticed because of a calf issue. So Take yeah, I mean, time. you hear calf, calf in August and September. It's like, yeah. vroom, vroom, vroom. Right. like it, it, it could cost you a season. It has right. costed every a ton of people their season. But if they, they literally, there's not a lot of teams that can say this. They have the luxury. They have the luxury to not play him. They, totally they have do. the luxury to not rush it because they're that good. Uh, with all that being said, Bobby, what's the most interesting aspect of this Vikings Niners game? The Vikings defense did really well in this matchup last year. You know, mm-hmm. the Vikings caused chaos. Like, they blitzed 65% of the time, even though they didn't get pressure. But what they do is, man, is they just, they just change the picture post-snap, and it makes it really tough. And Purdy threw two interceptions down the stretch in this game while also containing McCaffrey, right? So, you know, is the 49ers rushing game going to be as good as it was week one against the team that did uh, good against them? Um but here's the real thing is, okay, what does the Vikings Sam Donald offense look like against a defense with talent? Because Nick Bosa is a baller, right? He's going to challenge those tackles a lot more than Brian Burns and Kayvon Thibodeau did. <laughs> Do better, you two. Um, yeah. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Because the Vikings offense is really talented, and it's a Sam Donald revenge game. So mm. I, I think Sam Donald is going to – I, he still has like a handful of like boneheaded plays in him. Uh, and I think the 49ers make him pay, end up winning this game. So we just finished up talking about the the Falcons and how Kirk isn't right. I also think that he just left the perfect coach for him. I am just such, I'm the biggest cheerleader of the Kevin O'Connell fan club. I, I thought when JJ McCarthy landed there, it was great. I think for Sam Darnold, I'm not going to go as far to say that I think that they're a playoff team. Uh, obviously I, I saw Dan Orlovsky, whom I really like a lot, put that out there in the universe. And I don't know if they're that capable, but I do think that he's going to take care of Sam Darnold and put him in really good spots. And it wouldn't shock me if the Vikings take care of business here. Just wouldn't. In fact, you know what? I mean, they beat him last year. Pick him, Rose. I think. Pick him, Rose. I think it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, since 2021, in games in which Christian McCaffrey has not played, his team has gone two and ten. One of those wins was Monday night. Short week, travel to the middle of the country. I think it's happening. Put on that, my horn. Put on my horn. Well, I don't know how you do. How, the skull. how the hell am I going to make Viking horns on my head? Skull. That's a that's a moose. This is a moose. I don't know what the hell that. Where do we have Viking horns in this house? I doubt it. Um. That's the most out of context stat I've ever heard of all time, Rose. Those games were all with the shitty ass Panthers. Uh, there was one with the Niners <laughs> or two. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I thought I, I was like going to sneak that past you. Damn 49ers it. 49ers win with more than one interception. Panic? I 49ers. think the 49ers defense is way better this year. Nick Sorensen, he's going to be up for jobs next this offseason. Mm, 49ers, they, they, they get it. Okay, a uh, pair of winless teams going to Lambeau Field. Packers back at it. They haven't totally said that Jordan loves out, but we're which is crazy. crazy. Yeah, what we, I was going to ask you: Is he playing or not? Are they fucking with us or what? They're, they have to be. There's no way. This has got to be Malik Willis's game, and it, it'll take. That on. makes me think that he is going to play because how are they going to just start Malik Willis? That's an awful thing to do for a team that's trying to make the playoffs. Do they have another? Did they sign another quarterback this week? They have Sean Clifford and Sean and. Clifford. and um, and uh, Pratt on the practice Michael squad, Pratt. I believe. Yeah. I told you guys this. When I called the Browns-Packers game, Jordan Love played one series, threw a touchdown on the third play. 
after that, it was Sean Clifford and Michael Pratt. And I was like, they have to be trading for some veteran. They can't have one guy who's thrown one pass in the NFL and Clifford and another guy who just got drafted in the seventh round is just in case Jordan Love gets hurt. Yeah, they but, traded for a guy who probably has plus odds to complete less than 50% of his passes <laughs> or minus odds. He um he hasn't completed 50% of his passes in the NFL. He is 0-3. This will be his fourth start. He has yet to throw a touchdown, Malik Willis. He has thrown three interceptions. He has run for one. So we, at least we've got him in the book. So if it is Malik Willis and we expect it to be, is there any way the Packers could pull this off, Penick? The only hope is that they have the Indianapolis Colts playing soft and there's underneath stuff from Malik Willis to check it and then you get yards after the catch. Oh. That's the only way. Right, right Bob, you're, you're shaking your head, but yes? No, you need to implement a Tim Tebow game plan with the Broncos. Like zone read, triple option, like – I don't know. I, I'm shocked that they're rolling out there with Malik Willis as their starting QB in week two on a team that has playoff aspirations but is in a really good division. Like, it's it's shocking to me. Um, I can't believe that's the guy they went after. Look, can we stop that for a second? Yeah, they could have, like, if they want, go get Huntley or somebody. Exactly. Yeah. The Browns had, they hung on to Tyler Huntley for exactly that reason, to hope that somebody would say, all right, this guy started 10 games. He started a playoff game. Pro Bowl. Somehow he made a Pro Bowl because he was like the 12th guy in the AFC and the top 11 bowed out or something. Yeah, Malik Willis is the guy you're like, yeah, that's our backup. Would, wouldn't you have rather seen that for hard knocks? Like, we should get special decisions. They should just do short, hard knock shorts, mm. where they just knock on front office doors with uh interesting decisions so they should have gone up to the um to the Packers front office you know Brian Gunnarkunst and said hey do you mind if we come in while you're looking for a quarterback be like yeah and they call Tennessee um so um ran what would it take to pry Malik Willis away from you uh well we can we can fly him up there private we don't have to take anything here have him that's what I wanted to see they didn't even do a pick swap um, <laughs> so I, that's my thing. Like, I'm not even watching the, like, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of like, I'll watch the Packers offense, but like, it, there's no way. Right. But with this game, I'm just, my watching point is can Anthony Richardson be efficient? We know he can create the highlight plays. Like the, I was actually having this thought that like, say we're like two years from now and Anthony Richardson is not good, but he still shows some flashes. Like the throws he put on film last week. Colts fans in like year four will be hanging on like, I still think there's something there when you see throws like like those are the type of throws that guy made that a fan base can hold will hold on way too long. Like, you know, the Bears fans with Justin Fields. Um, but can Anthony Richardson be efficient? That's what I'm watching for in this game. Nine of 19 is not efficient. And that's what he was last week. Pettick, you got a pick? Colts also run the damn ball. That, yeah. should be, that should be this team's identity. Jonathan mm -hmm. Taylor, Anthony Richardson, Shane Steichen, get off to an early lead, run the damn ball, where Anthony Richardson being efficient shouldn't even be a conversation in this game. So run the damn ball, Colts. Bobby? Yeah. Packers front four was uh, disappointing in week one versus the Eagles. Colts win because they need like seven points. This is exactly where the Packers come back and bite you. Oh, Just boy. when you think it cannot happen. I don't, I'm not saying Malik Willis is going to be the reason they win, but you guys are looking at me like, oh my God, how do we get this? Here's the thing is I, I kind of agree with you. Like we're so out on this that this is the game where they win. Just, there's like, always idiots. one every week. There's yeah. always one, and this is it. This is it. Uh, Seahawks, Patriots. Interesting. Uh, we got a pair Wait, of... So you're, go you're going Packers? Yes. Okay. I just wanted the record to be clear. For my the record team. is clear. The record is clear, and I cannot wait to celebrate with you guys on Monday. Okay. I'll be, I will be taking the biggest victory lap, and I will have an entire cheese platter with me on Monday's show when they win. Cannot wait. Love uh, Seahawks and Pats, two young. Yeah, I might root for the Packers the if we get cheese platters. Hell yes, <laughs> hell yeah. I don't know what it'll look like when it gets finally lands in your state of Florida, but anyway, uh, Patriots, New England two and oh start would be crazy but i i don't think so because being lost in all of the patriots one solid running game for ramon j stevenson that defense is really good is the fact that 
I think the Seahawks just defense is going to go get after him. Like that secondary is nasty. That pass rush is probably going to destroy the Patriots up front and their linebackers are good. Um, like the, the Patriots scored 17 points, which I guess is like above what maybe some people expected for them. But like, I, I don't look at week one as like some Patriots, like, ah, oh, maybe we were too low on this team. I look at it as that one team that won week one that doesn't win a lot of games at the end of the year. I, I'm pretty confident in the Seahawks. But, hey, this, the, these are two good defenses, and when two good defenses play each other, there's always a chance for uh, one of the teams. So here's the thing. Jacoby Brissett was pressured on 48% of his passes last week. That was the highest percentage in the league. And that I was love, only Trey Hendrickson, basically. Yeah, and I love what Seattle's bringing to the table. I told you, Boye Mafe is a guy that I just am a huge fan of, and I think that Seattle defense is going to get better and better every week, and I think they'll get better this week. Penick? You know the Seahawks allowed two safeties in the same quarter? Yes. It's yeah. The strangest, strangest thing. So I could very much see Seattle playing another like nasty game where, you know, maybe the scores, the final score is somewhat close, but I I think they're too talented. I think, you know, even their 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 defense, uh, their defensive performance was better than the 20 points that they quote unquote allowed. Leonard Williams played really, really well. Byron Murphy played better than what you would expect a rookie to play. You mentioned the edge rushers as well, like Boy and Mafe. There's, there's too many answers on that defense. There's too much talent on that defense for me to say the Patriots are going to confidently get over 17 points. And then there's too many answers on offense that the Seahawks can go to between Geno, Kenneth Walker, the three receivers, a tight end. So for me to say they're going to score less than 17 points. So yeah, and, um, give me the Seahawks. Here's, here's the other thing is like you mentioned that, that pressure stat rose. The issue is that it was only from Trey Hendrickson, so like the Patriots were able to avoid it and avoid the sacks. With the Seahawks, that's not what's going to happen. Yeah, like they're going to have guys everywhere. that can finish, especially on the interior. Um, now that being said, I do like this Patriots defense is really good, man, and right. and the Seahawks may not have Kenneth Walker in this game. Um, like this will be a good matchup, right? Like here's a set: Geno and Joe Burrow both have the same exact time to throw in Week One. You know, bottom five in the NFL. They were both bottom 10 in average depth of target. You have Christian Gonzalez versus DK Metcalf. Duggar and Peppers can do it. Like, the Patriots defense can win this game. So I'm I'm not shocked at all if the Patriots win. Um, but I do think the Seahawks win in a low-scoring game. Panic? Yeah, I, I, have, I have the Seahawks. I, I just think they have too many answers offensive and offensively and defensively for the, for the Patriots. And I told you about the uh, early window for the Seattle Seahawks. There's a stat that goes with it. Might shock you. Since 2015, Seattle is 20 and 7 in the 1 p.m. Eastern kick window, the highest winning percentage in the NFL. Wow. So just when you think, oh, well, they're traveling east and they're waking up early, they don't give a shit. That's why I'm picking Seattle. On to our hurry up offense, guys, and we are going to run through these last six games. We'll start in Jacksonville, where a pair of playoff hopefuls are both trying to get off the Schneid. Browns and Jags. How much trouble is the loser? In in this game, panic quick. Well, I mean, it's going to be the Browns that, that are going to lose the game. They're going to be in trouble just because they have a quarterback problem. So the Jags are going to win it. They'll be they'll be one and one. Browns are going to be zero and two, and there's going to be a lot of conversations happening in Cleveland. Whoever loses is in a lot of trouble. This is tough, man. The Browns look really good versus Trevor last year, but he was injured. Jags win. I'm, I'm I think I'm out on. On Cleveland. Until next week, they'll probably win. Trevor Lawrence has lost his last five starts dating back to last year. Sub 60% completion percentage, only He's eight due. touchdowns and seven interceptions. As a Browns fan, that scares the hell out of me. Browns are falling to 0 2. The Jags will pick up the victory. Raiders traveling cross country to take on Lamar and the Baltimore Ravens. Lamar needed an extra rest day this week and then came back to practice and said, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, by the way, John Harbaugh said Derrick Henry is not getting 30 carries a game in Baltimore, but should he, Bobby? No, because no one does, but he should get 16 per game, uh, John Harbaugh. We know what, you know, that's what people are asking. No one's asking for 30 carries per game. But he should get a lot of carries. Ravens win easy. I agree with you in part because Lamar Jackson has not lost consecutive starts since late in the 2021 season, weeks 13 and 14. He will keep that streak alive. Justin? He will not keep that streak alive. This is the upset of the week. The Raiders will be defeating yes. the Baltimore Ravens. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I think the Raiders defensive front is going to be too much for that offensive line. Um, and I think the Raiders win a nasty, nasty, like this could be nine, six, ugly, nasty. Uh, Rams who are really banged up, particularly on that offensive line, take an 0 and one record into the desert. Arizona Cardinals looked really good in Buffalo for about three quarters. And then they kind of pootered down the stretch. Uh, how much do the injuries worry you not only for the Rams long-term panic, but this weekend for 60 minutes of football? Um, a lot of I feel like a lot of their injuries are coming on the offensive side of the ball, and the Cardinals just aren't going to challenge you that much on the defensive side of the ball. So I think the Ravens are going uh, the Rams, excuse me, the Rams are going to be fine. <clears throat> Rams are going to be fine. The Rams win. They go on the road. Win. Rams win. I'm actually not confident in this, but I got the Rams winning. I'm not confident in either because I think the Cardinals could do fun things offensively, but I think the Rams just have better everything. Like they have an advantage, their coaching schematics. I like Gannon. And I even like the Cardinals offense, but I'm not confident in the Cardinals ability to finish games. They did put two more offensive linemen on the injured list. Noteboom and Avila. They're done for at least four weeks. Puka is gone for that same stretch at least as well. Uh, with that being said, Matthew Stafford has had a 300 yard passing game in four straight games. I think that continues. That's the longest active streak in the NFL. I got the Rams a winner. Uh, Chargers at the Panthers. Bobby, the path to 13 wins. Will it hit a stumbling block? It will not. And this is part of my path to a lot of wins. I know 13 is probably not going to happen. But as their schedule is so weak, they're going to win. And the number one ranked scoring defense in the NFL after week two will be the Los Angeles Chargers. Mm. Yeah, I mean... Jim Harbaugh this week was still talking about Khalil Mack three days after he picked up that fumble. He's like, he's the best thing ever. I love him. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if he walked into Harbaugh's crib. I don't know if he's still living in an RV or if he was just doing that during training camp. But there probably are several posters of Khalil Mack on his walls, my guess. I've got the Chargers in this one. It's a no-brainer. I tried to sneak the Panthers past you guys as a winner last week. That obviously came back and kicked me right in the onions. Penick? I have the Chargers as well. Uh, I'm interested to see the time of possession battle here. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the Chargers win it like 37 minutes to 23 minutes. Uh, Jets are on the road for the second time in six days. Uh, they are 0-1, taking on the Titans, who are still trying to figure out how they blew a 17-point lead with the other team not scoring an offensive touchdown. Uh, any chance, Pennick, that the Jets fall to 0-2 following a short week and a lot of travel? Yes, there is a chance because it's the New York Jets, um, but I'm going to say no. It's not going to happen. Uh, the Jets are going to win, and Nathaniel Hackett, don't hold back this team. Let Aaron Rodgers show the ball in early downs. Let them get out to a lead, and then you can run the ball in first down when you have it, when you have a 10- or a 13-point lead going into the second quarter or in the third quarter. That's when you can run the ball. I did not have a harder time picking a game than this to where I actually Ooh. don't – I type oh. out every single pick. I don't have anything typed out for this. <laughs> okay. Do you want some help? I'm. This is my only, like, I'm just going to be different. I'm going to pick something that I may not 100% believe because I do think the Jets win. But I'm not confident. So I'm, I'm going to pick the Titans. I think that I'm going to pick the Titans to win um, because I'm not confident in my pick. So I'm going to, I'm overthinking it and picking the Titans. There's no way that the Jets defense will be as bad as it was on Monday night. I was shocked. I know that it's San Francisco. I know it's Kyle Shanahan. I know they've got a ton of good players, even without CMC. But I was surprised about that aspect. It's going to take Rodgers a, a little bit of time, but they're going to hold the ball for more than 22 minutes like they did on Monday night in that loss against San Francisco. I like the, the Jets in that one. And finally, guys, we get to your beloved New York Giants. It's a battle of winless teams in Washington, or at least in Maryland where they play. You worried, boys? I don't even see them on the document, and I forgot that they played this weekend. <laughs> that's because they weren't in the document, and then Chris Rose texted us about it, Justin. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that, um, that was not intentional. I did not intentionally leave them out of the document, but that is my fault. If they don't win this week, I probably will not pick them any other game of the year outside of a game in Germany. Giants win. With the, I, I, I'm not impressed with Jaden Daniels. No, I'm not impressed with Daniel Jones either. Uh, I, I think the Giants win this game. 
You know, you. I'm just going to tell you this, Bobby. You know way more football than I do, but you are so hard on young players. It depends if I like them or not. Which, <laughs> which one? It honestly does. <laughs> oh, but, I mean, you, you, I'm, I'm out on Bo Nix. I'm out on Jaden Dane. They played. Oh, I didn't say I was out on Bo Nix. I said the Steelers are going to dominate Bo Nix. Yeah. I'm not out on either. of. Oh, I, I'm not, I've never been in on Bo Nix. Jaden Daniels can still get there, but it was – it's one thing to have struggles. I have never seen a quarterback be so – drop back. Not Sometimes not even getting – like sometimes his first read would be there and it's like check down or run, check down or run, check down so or Cliff, run. Cliff Kingsbury sucks too. Which That's the other thing is Cliff Kingsbury didn't do many favors either. There's a lot of isolation stuff. We're the one, the one Joe Tryon – the one Joe Tryon sack that he that he had on Jaden Daniels, that there was three guys open. So you're like, yeah, Jaden Daniels has to throw the ball, but mm-hmm. I mean, man, there's just Cliff Kingsbury doing no favors. And I mean, ask, yeah. ask Kyler Murray how much he was running in, in that. It's offense a bad too. matchup. It's a bad mix up. Those two. Um, that so that's it's it's so it's and that's just, that was his issue in college. Um, I, now I think Jaden Daniels is going to get by this year with his legs, but you can't. Yes. I think three years from now. That shit is worrisome where I said in the draft process he might just be skinny Justin Fields. And week one did not do anything to make me not think that. All right. Um, so you guys both have your team. You gotta pick um, the commanders. I didn't I didn't pick. I didn't I didn't pick. And the commanders win. You know what? Shame on you for not believing in your team, Panic. <laughs> I got you, I got that ass covered. I'm good. Here we go. Let's go. I know that didn't sound great, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I got the G-Men. All right. I got the G-Men. Okay. All right. Uh, this is always fun. I always love previewing matchups. We return on Monday. We'll see how we did with our picks. We'll see how the games went. Week two. Everybody enjoy your games. Gosh, I love it. For producer Mikey and Bobby Skinner and Justin Pennick, who doesn't believe in his own team, I am Chris Rose. We will see you Monday here on Football Today, presented to you by Captain Morgan.